Good afternoon. Welcome to this program highlighting seven recent additions to the museum's permanent collection. I'm Frank Goodyear, co-director of the museum with my wife, Ann Collins Goodyear. First, some good news to share tonight. We will distribute tomorrow a press release announcing that the museum will be reopening to the public on Thursday, July 1st. On the museum's website tomorrow, you will find information about visiting and about the new exhibitions that will be on view. We can't wait to welcome you back in person. You'll find that nearly every gallery has been reinstalled. During the period when we've been closed to the public, we have been busy continuing the work that the museum is known for, namely planning exhibitions, organizing programs, working with faculty and students, and making acquisitions, among other things. This afternoon, it's wonderful to unveil, at least virtually, a few of the artworks that have been recently added to the museum's collection. As many of you know, the museum takes great pride in a collection that includes artworks from around the globe and made over the past 5,000 years. We are grateful for the generosity of alumni and other friends who have presented works to the museum over more than two centuries and to those who have established endowments that allow the museum to purchase works for the collection. I'm joined today by four colleagues, Sean Burris, the museum's Mellon postdoctoral curatorial fellow, Elizabeth Humphrey, class of 2014, the curatorial assistant and manager of student programs, Laura Sprague, consulting curator of American Decorative Arts, and my fellow co-director, Ann Collins Goodyear. At the end of our seven short presentations, there will be time for questions, and you're welcome to submit them using the Q&A function. Also, please note that closed captioning is also available and that we will be posting a recording of this program on the museum's website in the next week or so. We've decided to proceed in a chronological fashion, which means that we will start with Elizabeth and an 18th century French pastel that we have recently acquired. Elizabeth, take it away. Thanks, Frank. Hello, everybody. So I'm delighted to share um, or to start our presentations this evening by sharing this 18th century portrait of a biracial woman done by pastelist de Champ de la Terre. Not much is known about the artist, uh, though we know he was active in Paris, France around 1760. According to the Dictionary of Pastelists before 1800, a Monsieur de Champ advertised his arrival in the French Caribbean in 1767 and returned two months later to France. Upon his departure, he was selling a, quote, fine collection of pastel paintings, unquote, to residents of Saint-Domingue. A portrait of an indigenous woman in the Dutch Caribbean done in a similar style helped me to better identify the artist. Next slide, please. In this pastel, we see a light-skinned woman wearing a choker, along with a textile shawl and head wrap. A label on the back of the structure describes the woman depicted as a mulatress or a mulatto woman. Additionally, this pastel is described as a portrait de fantasy, suggesting that the woman depicted here is fictitious. Portraits de fantasy are an artistic convention popularized by French artist Jean-Honoré Fragonard that conflate the real and imagined. It's a deliberate play on portrait conventions. We can learn more about Deschamps' perception of reality by examining this portrait of a biracial woman more closely. So while the portrait may depict a fictitious woman, it is likely that Deschamps based his pastel on biracial women that he likely encountered during his travels throughout the Caribbean. The head wrap and choker necklace seen here appear in several paintings that document women of African descent in the Caribbean. As with most of these works, biracial women's identity is marked overtly through their dress, in particular, the head wrap and tying styles. Next slide, please. 
The tying style in Deschamps Pastel is similar to that featured in Agostino Brunias's Linen Market Dominica, circa 1780. For those who are unaware, there were different head wrap and tying styles found throughout the African diaspora. Some were region specific, while others traveled as people circulated around the globe. In Brunias's painting on the left here, we see several styles represented, and this is the case in most paintings depicting women of African descent in the Caribbean and across the southern United States. Despite her light or perhaps passing skin tone, people viewing our pastel, the 18th century pastel on the right, would have immediately understood her race because of the head wrap, which was commonly associated with women of African descent across the diaspora. Another interesting bit about this Brunias Deschamp comparison here is the appearance of the choker necklace. In Brunias's painting, only the lighter skinned women are wearing this choker, which prompts me to question whether this necklace was perhaps another way of marking one's identity. There is little research on these chokers that I've been able to find. So my question is a curious observation at this stage. Next slide. It is unclear whether Deschamps produced this painting in the Caribbean or upon his return to France, making it a little difficult to locate this fictitious woman within a specific geographical location. What the pastel does reveal, however, are certain conventions of depicting women of color across the 18th century. In particular, images of biracial women often heighten their quote unquote exoticism and emphasize their black ancestress ancestry through modes of dress and presentation. This pastel and the themes of representation that it brings to light will be explored in the upcoming exhibition, There is a Woman in Every Color, which will be on view in September. So with that, I will pass things back to Frank. Elizabeth, thank you. I am pleased to present this 1805 medal featuring a handsome likeness of George Washington. This work is a gift of an anonymous Bowdoin graduate. This medal joins one of the most distinguished collections of historic medals and plaquettes in North America. <clears throat> Known as the Eccleston Medal for the British gentleman who commissioned it, it is regarded as one of the most important medals honoring Washington. Created in 1805, six years after Washington's death, it portrays him as a military leader dressed in metal armor, a costume born from the imagination of a British artist uh, and not someone Washington would ever, not something that Washington would ever worn. The medal's designer, Thomas Webb, had never seen Washington in person, and his portrayal is likely based on popular prints of the period. Daniel Eccleston was a British merchant and insurance broker who lived in Lancaster, England. As a young man, he traveled on several occasions to North America, visiting Canada, the United States, and different British colonies in the Caribbean. A Quaker, he supported the fledgling United States after the Revolutionary War, and like many Europeans and Americans alike, was a great admirer of the United States' first president. On one trip, Eccleston visited Washington at Mount Vernon, Washington's plantation in Virginia. Eccleston commissioned British artist Thomas Webb to produce bronze medal to honor Napoleon Bonaparte in 1802 and George Washington in 1805. He sent the Washington medal to various uh, Americans, including then President Thomas Jefferson, Washington's nephew Bushrod Washington, and Supreme Court Chief Justice John Marshall. Jefferson designed a circular frame for his copy of the medal and hung it in his home, Monticello in Virginia. It still hangs there today. In his letter of gratitude to Eccleston, Jefferson wrote in 1807, and I quote, that our nation should entertain sentiments of gra gratitude and reverence for the great character who is the subject of your medallion is a matter of duty. 
His disinterested and valuable services to them have rendered it so. But such a monument to his memory by the member of another community proves a zeal for virtue in the abstract, honorable to him who inscribes it, as to him whom it commemorates." Unquote. It is believed that Eccleston sympathized with the native peoples in North America and was critical of their mistreatment and the dispossession of their lands. Evidence to support this claim includes the addition of a native figure on this medal's verso with the inscription, the land was ours. This unidentified man is pictured semi-nude holding a bow and arrow. <clears throat> His representation as a so-called noble savage aligns with racist perceptions shared by many non-natives in North America and Europe during this period. As I mentioned previously, the museum is fortunate to own one of the largest and most distinguished collections of medals in North America. Created mostly in Europe and the United States, these medals spanned nearly 600 years, from the early 15th century to the present day. In the last several years, museum staff and several Bowdoin students have digitized this collection, made it available online, and in 2018, installed highlights in a special student curated exhibition. We are really excited to add this medal to the museum's collection. It exemplifies the high regard that many held Washington, especially in the years immediately after his death. Created in the same year as the museum's celebrated portraits of Thomas Jefferson and James Madison by Gilbert Stuart, it invites productive conversations about this period in European and American history, about the role of artists in memorializing distinguished statesmen, and about the dominant society's understanding of Native peoples. Many, many thanks to our anonymous donor. And with that, now back to Elizabeth. Hello again. The next piece I'll present today is this Edgefield pottery jar made around the 1840s. Edgefield pottery is considered one of South Carolina's quintessential artistic traditions with beginnings around the 1810s. Primarily consisting of alkaline glazed stoneware such as this, these ceramics were produced in the Edgefield District of South Carolina, which is on the southwest border of the state closest to Augusta, Georgia. This area was known for its rich clay deposits. In the early 19th century, several families established pottery manufactories in the Edgefield District. Many of these manufactories were owned by European Americans, but enslaved African Americans performed the majority of the labor intensive work, such as wheel throwing and firing the wares. The Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts, or MESDA, has identified nearly 3,000 enslaved craftsmen working in these pottery manufactories. One of the enslaved powders identified from this period is David Drake, born between 1801 and 1873. Drake is one of the only individuals whose work can be positively identified, partly because of his commonly signing his name on the bodies of the vessels he threw. Over 150 of his documented examples bear dates, incised inscriptions, and verses, which is quite exceptional when considering that there were laws during this period that prohibited literary education and knowledge among enslaved people. Lewis Miles was one of the early pottery owners in Edgefield, owning both the Stony Bluff Manufactory in Horse Creek Valley, which is where this jar was made, and Miles Mill. Lewis Mile owned the enslaved potter David Drake between 1840 and 1843, and then again beginning in 1849. Scholars believe that David Drake produced most of his creative work um, while at Stony Bluff Manufactory. This work is unsigned, but given the creation date of around 1840s and knowing that David Drake was enslaved to Lewis Miles at the time, it is possible that Drake was the potter responsible for this jar. The jar's form is common among Drake's vessels, this sort of wide body, consistently thrown jar with small handles affixed to each side. 
It is hard to tell from the image, but the jar is sizable and has a nice weight to it. I personally enjoy seeing the ring marks in, on the inside where you can get a sense of the throwing process. The jar's alkaline glaze is also noteworthy in that Southern American potters rediscovered a centuries old glazing technique used by Chinese, Japanese, and Korean potters, highlighting the continuation and the circulation of ceramic practices across the globe. We are fortunate that this edge filled jar offers insights into ceramic production in North America, specifically craft production in antebellum America. The jar also allows the museum to better represent and contextualize the narratives of enslaved people in our collection. The jar is currently on view in reframing the collection, new considerations of European and American art, 1475 to 1875, which is an exhibition that strives to integrate underrepresented narratives into the larger history of Europe and the Americas. With that, I'll pass things over to Anne. Thank you, Elizabeth. In 2018, the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation generously donated to the Bowdoin College Museum of Art a remarkable gift of 10 distinct prints and eight trial proofs by the transformative artist. The prints reflect Frankenthaler's work in a broad range of techniques over the course of more than three decades, from the late 1960s to 2000. We look forward to sharing these works in their entirety with our community early next year as we open an exhibition juxtaposing these prints by Helen Frankenthaler with work by her contemporary, the Boston-based artist, Joe Sandman. Tonight, however, I wish to present one work from the recently acquired collection, Frankenthaler's Sanguine Mood, created in 1971. Let's begin by taking a step back to juxtapose it with Frankenthaler's best known work, Painting Mountains and Sea. Let's see. Just a moment, we're just having a little issue advancing the slides. There we go. So taking a step back to juxtapose it with Mountains and Sea, created in the wake of a trip Frankenthaler made to Nova Scotia in the summer of 1952. As she later related about the painting, created on unsized cotton duck, before, I had always painted on sized and primed canvas, but my paint was becoming thinner and more fluid and cried out to be soaked, not resting. In Mountains and Sea, I put in the charcoal line gestures first because I wanted to draw in with color and shape, the totally abstracted memory of the landscape. I spilled on the drawing and paint from the coffee cans. The charcoal lines were original guideposts that eventually became unnecessary. I got up on a ladder after I'd made the picture and looked down at it and called to my studio mate to take a look. We were both sort of amazed and surprised and interested. Frankenthaler's description of this painting contains within it many of the characteristics that would also influence her printmaking, the power of color, the investment in experimentation, and a process of learning from the work itself. Another quality that stands out to me, it's Frankenthaler's desire to capture what she refers to as the abstracted memory of the landscape. Indeed, Frankenthaler's unconventional pictorial techniques had a serious goal to capture that sensation which could not otherwise be expressed. Indeed, as the artist put it, I think that for myself, Feeling and making the image happen are essentially the same thing. Perhaps the most important thing the artist brings to, image, to the image making act cannot be expressed in words. It's that je ne sais quoi, literally that which I don't know, that hopefully produces beautiful art. Sanguine mood, which refers through its title to the artist's quest to express a sense of cheerfulness and optimism, similarly testifies to that desire to capture a feeling that cannot adequately be conveyed in language, but rather which an artist might seek both to capture for herself and then to impress upon the viewer through their response to the action of color and line on the surface. 
The title conveys the attentiveness to hue, characteristic of an artist who mixed her own colors. For the etymology of the term sanguine, meaning to be of a hopeful disposition, derives from the healthy, the healthful ruddy glow of a complexion suffused with red blood. A sanguine mood then expresses both a feeling and an appearance. But if the upbeat sensation the artist sought to express through her work may be a transitory experience, the care with which Frankenthaler approached it reflects, reflects her painstaking quest, indeed her meticulous research, to determine how most effectively to express that state of being. The time and labor required to picture a passing sensation represents precisely the type of contradiction Frankenthaler relished in her work, a paradox she, she would describe as, and I quote, the wrong things that make it right. Sanguine mood required eight trial proofs. Over the course of this series, the works rotated. Indeed, the piece seems originally to have started with a horizontal orientation. The changing framework intrigues me given the association of horizontal formats with depictions of landscape and that of the vertical with portraiture. It's almost as though Frankenthaler were asking herself whether it was the vision that provoked a happy outlook that she wished to produce or the evidence of that pleasure in one's complexion. As one looks closely at the works, it becomes clear that Frankenthaler was also experimenting with the placement of particular hues on the surface of her paper. This brings us to the question of technique. The work is made from a combination of silkscreen and pouchoir, a French term meaning stencil. In its final presentation, the work consists of five colors applied in this sequence. Tangerine using a, a stencil, green using a stencil, red using a silk screen, black using a silk screen, and transparent white using a stencil. The paper is suffused with a warm light orange, suggesting the healthy glow implicit in the title. The sanguine reference is accentuated by the red mark at center, and the graceful curves of the black lines echo the, gen the gentle undulations produced where the color fields come together. The experimental process required to reach the final state was quite deliberate. Frankenthaler explained it this way, as the print evolves, it tells you, you tell it, you have a conversation with the print. The dialogue between Frankenthaler and Sanguine Mood echoes that between her work and the history of art more broadly. Indeed, Frankenthaler's own interest in the pouchoir technique grew out of her admiration for its use by Sonia Delaunay and her collaboration with the author Les Sendrar for his publication, La Prose de trans Sibirien et de la Petite Jeanne de France, for which the artist created vivid pouchoir prints. The artist's book actually consisted of a single sheet of paper stretching to a length of six and a half feet and then folded accordion style for distribution. Frankenthaler vividly remembered the fun-filled sessions with assistants who helped her to employ the technique as she began to use it in 1970. It's tempting to imagine that those exuberant recollections may even have helped to inspire the title of her 1971 work, Sanguine Mood. But for the artist, this fun was also in earnest, allowing her to pursue important artistic ends. She welcomed what she described as, quote, the difficulty, the challenge, the fascination, and often the productive clumsiness of learning a new method, the wonderful puzzles and problems of translating with new materials, along with the creation of what the artist has made within the medium, there can often be an original creative development of the medium itself. This becomes the bouquet of a fine workshop collaboration beyond the conventions, close quotes. Frankenthaler's work then is a tribute to the expansive potential of creative experimentation, to the opportunity to test, to play, and to contemplate, a tribute to the importance of embracing that which may not initially be comfortable, but which may in time expand the mind, spirit, and body. 
Perhaps it is precisely this willingness to pilot new approaches that leads ultimately through the pleasure of expanded consciousness and capability to that sanguine mood evoked by this print. Thank you so much. And it's now my pleasure to turn the floor to my colleague, Laura Sprague. Thank you, Anne. It's my great pleasure to present this wonderful large vase, the work of Maine ceramic artist, Melissa Leslie Green. It's the generous gift of the estate of Christopher P. Monkhouse, a brilliant scholar, curator, and collector who commanded mastery over a wide range of objects. Christopher was especially fond of studio ceramics and befriended many artists in the field. Green's vase is one of over 60 examples of studio pottery from 1940 to 2014 that have come to Bowdoin and reveal Christopher's love of American art and craft traditions. Working on Deer Isle, Melissa Green has always looked to the natural world for inspiration, seen here in her pot entitled It Look, Fabulous Fish. She first experienced life in the far north in Lapland as a teenager. And she writes, here I realized a strong interest in how people living a self-reliant lifestyle close to and with an essential respect for nature held a strong intuitive commitment to beauty, which is reflected in their daily lives. She found it look to be the perfect title for her work, for in Inuit it means fabulous fish. Wheel thrown with about 18 pounds of fine white earthenware. It measures over 12 inches high and 13 inches in diameter. Her decoration of intertwined black and white fish swimming in alternate directions features a sophisticated technique called terra sigillata used since ancient times in place of a glaze. It's a refined clay slip, terra sig as it's called, can be burnished as an integral part of the vessel. After applying a black stain and a coating of wax, Green carved her fish into the surface and she finds carving in clay to be very satisfying and not unlike carving a wood block for a print. She used a simple wood smoke firing at the end to cut the brightness of the white clay and a final burnished wax coating adds gloss, further enhancing the surface. Green has been using the terra sigillata for almost uh, for most of her 50 years in the pottery studio, and this long experience accounts for her masterful results where body and decoration create a harmonious, lustrous whole. Next slide, Anne. Melissa Green's vase had pride of place in Christopher's beautiful home centered in the large double parlor under the 1860s chandelier and surrounded by his British and, architect British and American architectural drawings. Christopher acquired Green's vase at a craft fair on Mount Desert Island in 2006, but had come to know her while curator of European decorative arts at the Art Institute of Chicago. He met her during one of the American craft expositions held at Northwestern University. And it's another fortunate result of the many productive connections that Christopher made during his life in art and in craft. We look forward to sharing more of Christopher's wonderful collection in the months and the years ahead. Thank you. And Sean, my colleague is up next for the last work. Thanks so much, Laura. And uh, I do just wanna pause and offer a reminder to those of you at home that we will have time at the end of, the, of this evening's program for Q&A. So if you have any questions about the works that we're sharing this evening, whether the Duchamp Pastel, the Washington Medal, the Historic and Contemporary Ceramics, or the Frankenthaler print, do feel free to go ahead and enter those now using the Q&A feature. Now, I'm really excited about this next work. It's a hand-printed hand scroll by the Chinese contemporary artist Yunfei Ji. Yunfei Ji is renowned for his dramatic and intricately detailed landscape paintings, which are densely populated with real and fantastic figures who confront environmental crises that face modern China. 
Over 30 feet in length and with a printed image 10 feet long, this new addition to the museum collection unrolls a narrative of forced human migration in the wake of the Three Gorges Dam project a hydroelectric dam on the Yangtze River that was begun in 1994 and completed in 2011. While heralded as an engineering marvel and a modern miracle, flooding and other effects of this monumental engineering project displaced more than a million people during its construction and submerged countless archaeological and cultural sites. Here, the tra traditional hand scroll format and its extended landscape allow us to focus in on the human toll of the Three Gorges Dam project, capturing in both monumental scale and in intricate individual detail, the disruption and forced migration of millions. Next slide, please. Classical in form and contemporary in content, the scroll invites us to imagine the lives of environmental migrants, families, villagers, and animals, fleeing the intrusion of manufactured landscapes. The conventions of Chinese landscape painting favor idyllic scenes inviting leisurely contemplation, conventions that are very much at odds with Yun Feiji's use of this traditional form in order to convey scenes of disruption and dislocation and the chaos of migration and uprootedness. Next slide, please. In a text appended at the end of the scroll, the artist writes, 1.5 million people were displaced from the area of the reservoir. With their own hands, they tore down and moved 13 cities, 40 townships, and 1,300 villages, brick by brick, tile by tile. They had no choice but to leave the homes which their ancestors had lived in for generations. Neighbors and friends were scattered to different places. Next slide, please. The figures who populate the landscape in this scroll illustrate this brick by brick, tile by tile movement in sequential snapshots that capture moments of migration, both dramatic and banal. From villagers departing with overloaded bags, carts, hand trucks, and tractors piled high with belongings. Next slide, please. To scenes of watchful waiting and rest along the way. Next slide, please. The scroll ends with the migrants approaching the banks of the river where, like the scroll itself, they've run out of room. Where will they go? The viewer is invited to ask the question on the minds of the dispossessed villagers themselves. The 10 foot long horizontal image was hand, print, hand printed in China from over 500 hand carved wood blocks and was commissioned by the Library Council of the Museum of Modern Art. With environment, environmental issues rightfully at the forefront of our minds at home and abroad, Yunfei Ji's work is a powerful reminder of both the human source and the human toll of many of the crises we face. And now I'll turn the floor back over to Frank. Sean, many thanks. And like Sean, I want to uh, remind you that if you have any questions, uh, please submit them using the Q&A function. Uh, and after my remarks about this photograph, we will turn to these questions. So the final work uh, this evening uh, is When the Storm Ends, I Will Finish My Work by the Canadian artist Meryl McMaster. Born in 1988, McMaster is a Canadian Indigenous artist based in the city of Ottawa. Her practice is predominantly photography based and incorporates artist made props, sculptural garments, and performance. A graduate of the Ottawa College of Art and Design, she creates work that transports the viewer out of the ordinary and into a space of contemplation and introspection. The subjects she addresses in her work are often informed by North American indigenous histories. Like Cindy Sherman and other artists who photographed themselves in different costumes and tableau, she often takes center stage in her photographs, though does not consider these works self-portraits. McMaster has enjoyed wide critical acclaim since her first solo exhibition in 2010. Among her various honors, she is the recipient of a, the Socia Bank New Generation Photography Award and the Reveal Indigenous Art Award. 
Her work has been acquired by various public collections within Canada and the United States, including the Art Gallery of Ottawa, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, and the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian. When the Storm Ends, I Will Finish My Work is one element in a three-part multimedia installation that is currently on view at the McCord Museum in Montreal. The installation takes inspiration from the McCord's collection of late 19th century glass bell jars that preserve natural history specimens. McMaster has written about these bell jars and the installation at the McCord, and I'll quote her. <clears throat> Within the jars, taxidermized animals and preserved plants appear as restricted and silenced creatures of utility perpetually at the service of humanity's often self-destructive desire to exert control over time and nature. This desire is a reminder of how easily the wisdom of the land and its history has been disregarded. Reflecting upon these thoughts, I was inspired to create three works that in part borrow from the tradition of Vanitas in their observation of correlations between life and death, growth and decay, universal conditions shared by all living things. While we seek to control these fundamental processes with our technologies, as exemplified by the bell jar, the works in this installation consider and accept this fear of loss as a natural aspect of our experience, something that we all share and from which we should seek wisdom. When the storm ends, I will finish my work portrays a fatigued character caught in a dream state. She rests longingly. A desire for closeness with history and nature motivates her toil. Melancholy and loss are ever present. A hopeful candle continues to burn brightly in this dark moment. And that's the end of this uh, long, uh, but I think really quite revealing uh, and poetic um, uh, quote. The acquisition of this exciting photograph from 2021, just made earlier this year, continues the museum's recent commitment to add to its collections artworks by important contemporary indigenous artists. Over the past five years, artworks by five different indigenous artists have been collected, enhancing the museum's ability to engage with indigenous histories and issues. Yet until now, the museum did not own a single work by a female indigenous artist. We are excited about featuring this, ex this particular photograph in a new contemporary installation uh, scheduled to open uh, in July. It's a wonderful photograph and we're so pleased to bring it into the collection. At this time, uh, Anne and I want to thank our colleagues for their presentations tonight. Um, and we have a few minutes uh, for any of your questions or comments. A reminder, please use the Q&A uh, function to ask a question. And as we review uh, the questions that are being submitted, I'll start by asking uh, the group to reflect a little about what these new acquisitions represent in terms of the larger strategic collecting goals of the museum. Would somebody like to share some thoughts about uh, what these new additions to the collections mean uh, for the work that we're doing uh, on campus and in our wider community? I'm happy to say a few words about that, Frank. Um, you know, the, the museum is, is wonderful for its global and trans-historic collections. That's a, a legacy that's been built over generations now. And to live up to, to that legacy, um, I think we're putting in a lot of effort uh, and a lot of uh, energy into continuing to collect globally and with themes that engage the campus in interdisciplinary and international perspectives. Um, so that's one of the reasons that I'm so excited about the Yun Fei Ji work, not only because it uh, speaks to um, uh, the, the very real way in which environmental crises are, are unfolding around the, the, the world, that it's uh, challenges that is facing all of humanity, um, but it speaks also to the theme of migration and the various different kinds of migration that uh, we're seeing uh, across the globe today. 
Um, and that's a very uh, real theme that's being engaged in classes across the campus uh, from so many different perspectives. So um, this is just uh, one example of collecting that um, I think goes to that that continues to build a global uh, build on a, a tradition of a global collection and um, in, in really exciting ways help us uh, to thematically um, reach uh, Bowdoin students across the disciplines. Absolutely. Oh, that's and, wonderful. Anne, go ahead. Yeah, and Sean, thank you so much for those thoughts. Um, building on what Sean has just said, another area that we are certainly interested in uh, continuing to bolster our collection is in the area of work made by women artists. And so I've enjoyed very much the opportunity this evening to think about some very strong additions um, by extraordinary um, women artists of the recent past to our holdings. And the timing of that is particularly exciting for us, given the fact that this coming fall, Bowdoin will be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the matriculation of women to Bowdoin, which gives us an additional an opportunity to think about um, a transformative moment in American higher education, but also to think about the extraordinary achievements that have been realized um, really uh, over centuries by women um, by continuing to think about what we can do to represent um, the, extraordinary, the extraordinary diversity of work um, and opening up new ways to understand our collection past and present um, through these new acquisitions. I'll also say that um, over the past couple of months, we've been asking a new um, questions around who is being represented in our collection um, and trying to address any gaps or lacks that we've, we've noticed. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy to see the strides that we've been making around um, more inclusion in, in terms of whose stories we're telling. Um, we have a strong collection of, of American art, but thinking about the nuance of American history and trying to um, incorporate as many stories as possible, I think we've been doing um, some good work in, in bringing new things to the collection that can tell a little bit more the histories and legacies of this nation. Elizabeth and Sean, that's that's terrific. Uh, Laura Sprague, we have a question from the audience uh, for you. Mm -hmm. um, Alan Christenfeld, class of 1973, asks, is it my imagination or does Melissa Green's pottery vase seem <laughs> influenced by M.C. Escher? What do you think? I think sometimes, um, I think it's the black and white, um, the, the black and white imagery that, and, and, and in that particular pattern, they, it, it can do that. But when you see her other work that's colored um, and the, the patterns are more varied, it, it's, it's not so, it's not like that. Have you had an a, yeah. Laura, have you had an opportunity to uh, uh, exchange uh, email or talk? I, 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 I was able to um, I was able to talk to Melissa this week and she is just delightful and she in, she has her art practice. Her husband has worked works in metal and they have an adorable goat farm. <laughs> so she she's um, uh, juggling all these things, but she's um, it's, it's just amazing that Christopher found her um, in Chicago of all places. And um, to, to, um, to, to, to have the good uh, sense to acquire her, her pot in when, when he saw it in, in um, Mount Desert. Wonderful. But, I'll ask another sort of question uh, again to the whole group. And I think that perhaps uh, audience members might be interested in sort of the process by which we um, identify, uh, review, and ultimately select new um, works for the museum's collection. Would anybody like to sort of talk about um, how this all works and how works um, come to our attention? Well, I thought it was amazing that uh, when Elizabeth was working on her exhibition, um, There's a Woman in Every Color, that Sean saw that the the reference to the the wonderful pastel, and 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 to have the Copley portrait of the pastel portrait of Elizabeth Bowden, and then to be able to acquire that wonderful um, French work of a of a biracial woman. What a 
it just it, it was just amazing to me that you can still find these things and and make these kinds of connections yeah I, i'll say to that point sometimes you have an aha moment when you see things in a catalog or you're browsing gallery sites and you know you have your personal shopping list of course but then you have your museum <laughs> shopping list um and when and when sean presented um the pastel he mentioned you know maybe this might work for your show and i said yes yes it will um, <laughs> and it was just a, a sign to to pursue it um so i'm i'm happy it all worked out you know, I, I'm glad you asked that question, Frank, because of course we all have our, our personal interests and, and exhibitions we're working on. Um, and so things you do have fortuitous moments like uh, like the Deschamps pastel that just left off the page. Um, and I, I'm so glad we were able to find a home for that. But we also, uh, a lot of our collecting is, is through other connections and conversations we're having across the campus. So, you know, it gives me a chance to acknowledge the, the help and support that we get from our faculty colleagues. Uh, I would not have been able to go out and to locate the uh, Yunfei Ji work and to understand just the impact it could have on campus were it not for the conversations that I had with Professor Xu Jin Tsui and with Peggy Wong, um, who have helped me to, to really think through what it would mean to bring something like that to campus and, and help with discovering artists. Um, and that's just one example of the way that uh, our faculty colleagues really help um, shape what we're collecting, what they're teaching can be a real driver. John, that's great. I'll also add that, you know, um, our collecting is also the result of, you know, conversation, ongoing conversations uh, amongst uh, the curators, among members of the advisory council, other sort of friends of the museum. And, you know, we have sort of a wish list of uh, things that we really are, are actively looking for. Um, yes, um, we, can, um, we can be reactive when something, you know, presents itself to us. Um, we can determine whether this is something that fits in our collection or not. Uh, but the better way is uh, when, you know, we are proactively going out and looking for something. And so, for instance, in the collecting of contemporary indigenous art, you know, uh, we've built out, a, you know, a list of um, a dozen or so, you know, contemporary artists whose work really interests us. Um, and, you know, going out and finding Merrill McMaster, uh, seeing a lot of, uh, of different work by her, much of which was sold out. Um, she is one of Canada's most hot uh, young artists these days. And, you know, the opportunity presented itself uh, to acquire um, the uh, beautiful circular photograph. Um, we knew when it became available and her gallerist told us about it, this was something that we should move quickly on for her work is uh, issued in very small editions. And uh, we um, were quick to um, uh, recognize this is something that would be a notable addition to the collection and, and, and we sprang. Frank, I, I might pick up um, on, a, on a question um, that's just been submitted um, about the new photograph by Meryl McMaster and um, the significance of the juxtaposition between some more, between contemporary and historic works in the collection. And I'd like to just make a few remarks and then I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Um, but I do think one of the great strengths of the collection is the fact that it is transhistorical and global in nature. And I will say that we find that that works from the past, um, from the present, are uh, constantly in conversation with one another. And I particularly liked, for example, this evening, being able to put Melissa Green's um, piece in conversation with the new acquisition by David Drake. Um, and I think that we find that um, present day concerns um, and uh, the questions that we're asking also help us to rethink um, work that, that was made um, centuries ago, such as the Deschamps Pastel, which um, brings to mind some very important questions around um, identity um, depiction and will be, I think, an extraordinarily important part of an upcoming exhibition um, curated by 
Elizabeth Humphrey that looks more broadly at the representation of women of color. Um, and Sean, it's also very exciting to see, um, you know, a Chinese um, contemporary artwork by Yong Fei Ji, which is clearly referencing a much deeper history of um, Chinese ink painting um, and deliberately picking up on traditions of the past to help us to make some very dramatic uh, juxtapositions with, again, contemporary concerns. So I think we find very often that our, our thinking is influenced by the scope of our exhibition, uh, or rather the scope of our, of our collections. Um, Frank, you might like to say a little bit more specifically about the McMaster in this regard. And I, I really like what you've just said. Um, I think one of the characteristics of a work that is really suitable to the collection is the new connections that uh, you can make between existing work uh, in the collection. And Bowdoin uh, is fortunate to have um, a wonderful, uh, albeit at this point somewhat small, uh, collection of art by uh, native, uh, native peoples uh, of North America. And, um, you know, it was so interesting when we saw the McMaster, uh, we kept thinking uh, about the kind of uh, ceremony that's being sort of enacted uh, in that uh, sort of constructed scene. And, you know, thinking back to other works in the museum's collections, including an extraordinary uh, 1890s uh, painting on linen of a Lakota Sundance. Uh, and to be able to put a historic work and a contemporary work uh, in dialogue with one another, that fosters the kinds of productive conversations uh, that faculty and students uh, really, really benefit from and make the museum this unique educational uh, resource. Yeah, and Frank, that, that prompts me also to just wanna um, offer a few more words about the ways in which we go about collecting. Um, we were very fortunate that Laura Sprague shared with us an extraordinary work um, uh, that comes out of the collection of Christopher Monkhouse, who was an extremely distinguished curator of decorative arts um, at the Art Institute of Chicago, um, also had important roles at, at RISD and the Minneapolis Institute of Art over the course of his career. And I think it's also important to um, draw attention to the conversations that we um, have ongoing with our colleagues, as you've heard um, within our, our own walls um, about projects that we're working on, but it's also really exciting to work with friends and colleagues from beyond Bowdoin. And for example, we feel unbelievably fortunate to have brought in um, through the generosity of the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation, um, an extraordinary collection of the artists um, print works, um, which are very diverse in media. And that gift represented um, the, the opportunity to introduce Frankenthaler's collections to our co to, to Bowdoin for the first time. She was previously unrepresented in the museum and yet brings forward an incredibly important tradition of artistic experimentation leadership by um, a woman artist um, helping us to rethink just what was possible in art making. And the, the acquisition of that work in turn is helping us, is helping to make way for um, the interpretation of a, an extremely important um, artist from New England, Joe Sandman, um, who perhaps has not yet received the national and international acclaim that she deserves. We're really looking forward to juxtaposing those two artists next year. But, but we do find that with every acquisition comes an opportunity for new conversations that help us to better understand our collection and also create new opportunities to bring new voices um, into the collection, but also to the attention of the public. That's terrific. Uh, any final thoughts this evening? I have a question for you, Frank. I, <laughs> I, one of the things I love about the McMaster is that it's a contemporary photograph, but it looks like it's a cyanotype with that blue ground. And I, and I don't know if you know how she does that, but I, that's one of the things I, I love the color of it. <laughs> Laura, thank you. Um, to be honest, I haven't had a chance to ch chat with uh, Meryl McMaster about how she created um, the work, but it is true. Um, process technique in these works um, 
is really interesting and really valuable um, in terms of the teaching uh, that happens uh, at, at the museum. And certainly uh, our colleagues in the visual arts department are continually coming over to the museum uh, to show work that you know, demonstrates uh, historic and contemporary uh, artistic practices. Um, and so I do believe that uh, McMaster has created this sort of um, cyanotype, this kind of blue, uh, hued sort of uh, still life that serves as a kind of a backdrop, um, a sort of theatrical set uh, before which she enacts this uh, performance uh, for us. And um, I can't wait um, to put the uh, work on view. Um, it will be on view when the museum reopens next month. And uh, it'll be great to look more closely with, uh, with our faculty and student colleagues. It's really great. <laughs> well, thank, thank you so much. I think that's a lovely note um, to conclude our conversation this evening on. I want to thank very much um, each of my colleagues, Sean Burris, Elizabeth Humphrey, Laura Sprague, and Frank Goodyear for their um, very insightful remarks. I also want to offer a warm thanks to our colleagues behind the scenes who have helped make tonight's program possible, Leslie Bird and Suzanne Bergeron. And above all, we want to thank each of you in our audience who have taken time to join us this evening we are so excited uh, to reopen the museum to you. Um, we thank as well, of course, the many benefactors who have helped um, support the um, expansion of our collections. We cannot wait to open up a brand new exhibition of new acquisitions when we reopen on July 1st. Um, so we look forward to seeing you in person then, and we hope that you will also continue to join us throughout the program for continued online programming. We hope you have a wonderful evening and we look forward to seeing you in person at the BCMA next month. Thanks so much and good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.